Hi folks, Mike Avila here with Sci-Fi Wires Behind the Panel, coming to you from my personal fortress of solitude. Our guest today, a guy with a shelf full of Eisner Awards for books like The Vision, Mr. Miracle, and the little red but fondly remembered Omega Men series, which I believe is coming out in hardcover soon. And he also wrote about 85 issues of Batman that you may or may not have heard about. But ladies and gentlemen, Tom King. Oh, thank you for having me in the midst of plague. It's very nice to be here. It's <laughs> nice to see your face. It's comforting. I feel like it's con. No one's ever told like, me that. No, it's true. Like this is conscious. I should be seeing you all the time. We should be talking and buying books, and this is crap. And and separate. No, nothing. You know, it, it, it's funny. You're a uh, you're a big convention guy. You you not only appear at a lot of them, but you really make the most of it. You not only do a ton of interviews, but you're on the panels with with some of your fellow comic pros and, and friends. And then you're always on the floor, shopping around and stuff. I would imagine the fact that the convention circuit for most of 2020 is basically off the books, I would imagine, uh, is painful for you. It, it, it is legit painful. I dislike, I was at, I went to C2E2. Uh, you, you were there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I saw we you there. there. We hung out. And you had the gloves, you had the gloves. I had the gloves, hey, I didn't get sick, so God bless the gloves. God bless everyone at C2E2. I mean, I must have seen a billion people and I didn't get sick at all. So they were washing their hands and keeping to the rules and I appreciate all the nerds who followed all the rules. But I was like, okay, I better buy some crap because I might not have another chance to buy crap. And I didn't buy enough crap. We're both comic art guys. Uh, you know, we, we, we both uh, enjoy spending absurd amounts of money on on uh, on the original art that, that creates these magical books that we love, right? Yeah. Um, that's one of the things that worries me the most. Like on the other side of this, what a convention is going to look like? Am I going to feel comfortable flipping through all those binders and portfolios <gasps> full of these great expensive pages the same way? Because by the way, C two E two feels like it was a year ago. It and does. It was, right? it was a month ago. That's insane. That's insanity. But I remember looking through just endless portfolios and I'm thinking now, I go, I don't know if I'm really comfortable doing that anymore. I mean, I don't who knows. I mean, you hope they have a vaccine that saves us all and that it just goes away like things kind of do, you know, like, I mean, look, 1918 was a lot worse than this. Like young people died and the twenties are called the roaring twenties for a reason. It was one big rolling party. And, and people survived and thrived again. So, I mean, based on the one historical precedent that's at least just about 100 years old, there's a possibility that things could return to normal and we could still flip through Bart. I don't know. I hope so. Hey, let's, let's hope you are, you are correct. I, I, was, uh, I, told, I, I was talking to Jim Lee, who's, the, who's on top of this, guys. If you want to know the guy who's going to save comics, his name is Jim Lee. He drew the best-selling comic of all time, and he's on top of this and I told him, I said, the one suggestion I have is when this is all over, we're all going to be wearing masks, and I want a Batman mask. I want you guys to license Batman to some mask companies so I can get some of that stuff. Oh, there's a lot of money to be made in, 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 right? in custom uh, masks, for sure, 100%. That's the big thing coming, man. We're all going to look like Bane and shit. It's going to be fun, man. We'll be all the calm with our own little masks. It'll be fun. How's uh, Casa King uh, holding up during all this? You have three kids? I have three kids. I have 11, 9, and 5. Uh, so it's it's a lot of homeschooling. <laughs> it's, it's... Which, which one's homework has made you feel dumber? <laughs> um, the, uh, God, no, they all make me feel they're all because with the five year old he's learning to write his letters and I'm like I write my letters completely wrong. The eleven year old is making me feel dumb because he suddenly got really into comics because he's stuck in this house and there's only so many entertaining things but there's my room that's full of infinite graphic novels so he's going through my collections and he's like Dad. Uh, who were the f who drew Contest of Champions? And I was like, I don't know. I just, John Romita Jr. Which blew my mind, right? Wasn't Contest of Champions like 70 years ago? How is John Romita Jr. not an old man? John Romita Jr. is about 114 years old, and he 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 literally found the Fountain of Youth. It's unbelievable. I mean, John Romita Sr. is still around. You can go to John Romita Sr.'s today, house today. First of all, i got to stop you here. Your son is reading Contest of Champions. That is a well-raised nerd right there. Oh, yeah. That is, that's a historic book. First miniseries, right? That is an easy sell for an 11 year old. Yeah, when when sure. they get into comics, they're like, was there ever a time where they drafted a bunch of teams and just fought each other? It's like, yes, it's called Contest of Champions. They're like, yeah, I'm in. When I make recommendations to people who ask me, what are some good comics to read? I want to give it a shot. I recommend them standalone books. I recommend them The Vision, Mr. Miracle. I don't recommend Mr. Miracle right away because I go, you got to kind of work your way up to that. But I, re I recommend stories that they pick up, you know, in one volume, they read it. And if they never pick up another book, they know they got the, the complete story. That is, is is something that I think you guys do very well. And, and you know, we're going to talk about Strange Adventures here now. But I wanted to ask you, 
Are you seeing yourself more and more moving towards where you only kind of want to work on finite maxi series and out of continuity type stories like this? Yeah, I mean, that's all I'm doing right now. Uh, after I finished Batman, it was like six, five months ago, six months ago, I've like totally transitioned to this like new part of my career where I'm just working on, I'm working on these three different books, Batcat, Strange Adventures, and the mystery book that hasn't been announced yet, which was supposed to be announced at WonderCon or whatever, you know, who knows if we have cons again, we'll announce it. And they're all, yeah, they're all just Mr. Miracle copies. They're just, they're, they're 12 issue series, um, which are complete stories. And I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I love doing them. I do fear that after sort of doing these three, like there's, I don't know, there's, there's something missing. There's like, you sort of want to challenge myself or something. I don't know. Like if I just keep doing these little novelish things, am I putting myself in a box and repeating myself? I don't know. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to burst out of it in some ways. For now, the best way, the most fun I have making comics is making it the way I'm, I'm now. I've never been happier writing than I am now with these 12 with these three 12 issue series. When I talked to you at C2E2 about a year and a half ago, um, Strange Adventures 1 was about to come out and I hadn't read it yet. Now I'm able to to talk to you about it after reading the book. I like how you're looking at the, the line between myth and reality uh, as a theme in the book. The book is very much a, a dichotomy. You can tell it even with the different covers, which shows how one side of the story sees Adam Strange and then you have Doc Shaner's cover, which is beautiful, very silver agey. Talk about developing that theme and why that was important for you to, to explore in the story. And Mitch and I were going back and forth and sort of what kind of story we wanted to tell. And it was, I don't know, at the, the height of sort of the Mueller investigation when that was going on. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, I was just like, I want to write a story about people lying to you. Because I just feel like a lot of people in government were lying to us. And I want to write about the difference between lies and truth and sort of the seeking of truth and what. And we were looking to how to tell a story. Mitch came up with sort of Adam Strange. And I started seeing, it immediately saw it in my head as like, oh, there's two stories to be told here. There's, you know, there's that story of like the super adventurer of him living this life. And there's the story of what that really was like, what that, what the reality of that was. And sort of the distance between the myth of, you know, the hero who goes off and solves all our problems and the reality of what sort of colonialism and all that stuff is. And to do it with two different artists, I was like, oh, I can do that because Doc and Mitch are best friends. And that's sort of how it developed like that. It was the idea was, yeah, it was this idea to look into the idea between the sort of fantasies of what we have. Because I feel like all our fantasies are being crushed, like, constantly. Uh, what we thought our country was, what we thought our safety was, what we thought, like, all these myths I had growing up as a kid, I'm just throwing out the window each day. And I want to I wanna write about both the myths of them and what it's like to lose them. How is the current situation that we're in, this pandemic, and... Also, the, the way the government's been reacting to it and the response to it. Can you see that influencing how you craft the rest of the story? Oh, 100%. I just turned in an issue last week, and I was halfway through the issue, and I, and I was like, okay, I'm taking a swerve, and I'm going to take on this. Because I feel like um, movies and TV shows are all stopped now because it takes social interaction to make those things. Comic books are not stopped. Uh, we're stop, they stopped selling them, but we're still making them so that when the other side of this, you have an incredible amount of product. Um, and I was like, well, we can move a lot faster. Like people who, like I was talking to my, to a TV producer today. He's like, we got to take advantage of this and come with a show. I was like, great, two years from now, we'll talk about this. But I can make a comic that's about this moment right now, and it can be for sale in three months. Um, and so, yeah, Strange Adventures is is swerving towards that. The The, the, the paranoia and the idiocy and all, all that stuff of this time. And uh, I mean, yeah, for Strange Adventures, I mean, Strange Adventures was always about this idea that there was this invasion on another planet that was devastating and, and tore apart the entire planet, but they managed to repel it. But it did horrible damage to their entire society and changed them as a people and turned them into a different kind of people. And now the idea was this thing that came to Ran is now coming towards Earth. And so when I'm looking at that and writing that, I'm like, oh my God, this is about people who, are, who see something that, 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 hurt another, that hurt another culture and it's coming towards them and they're making preparations for that and they know it's coming. I was like, this thing is just a metaphor for where we are. Now that's probably me inducing my, putting my reality on my story, but it just seems like it's in the perfect place to tell that. Could the book have worked without having the two artist model? No, no, it couldn't work with that. The, the magic of the book is from how they contrast each other. Not to mention that Doc developed a lot of the story points in the past stuff, and he's really contributed to the plot. It's one of those books that couldn't exist without its form, and the, and the form couldn't exist without the book. The point of the book is the contrast between the two stories. Did you always have Mr. Terrific in mind to be uh, the guy who shows up at the end to, to investigate Adam? 
Yeah, yeah, it was always going to be, I wanted it to be like Billions, where it's sort of like there's two protagonists, and they were, and, and then, and they were fighting with each other, you know, when you see from both sides. I mean, that, that's the way this, the book works, like the issue one is about Adam, issue two is about Mr. Terrific, issue three, and it just goes back and forth to see the different perspectives. So I needed another protagonist, and he's underrated, and he's underappreciated, and he's the third smartest person, which is kind of an insult to him. And... <laughs> I love that description, the third smartest. Yeah. He's not even the second. He's yeah. The third. <laughs> I, put in a, I put this in a Heroes in Crisis when he gets interviewed. He talks about, like, sometimes when you lap two other people, it seems like you're third, but you're actually a lap ahead of them. <laughs> so, like, that's how. So, uh, yeah, it was always supposed to be Mr. Terrific. I, I think he's the perfect person for this. Yeah, it's, he's cool. A much more lighthearted question. Point out to something cool behind you there and tell me what was the story behind it. Like that Superman comic directly behind you. Superman, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I got this. Let's see, I got it's a golden age Superman. I got this um, because my daughter was at Third Eye Comics and saw the magnet of it, the cover, and loved it and put it up in a room. So when I saw the real issue, I bought it. And it's a gorgeous. I think that's now a Plastino cover would be my guess. That's an awesome, awesome cover. I'm writing uh, Adam Strange a lot. So I have a lot of my big inspiration for Adam Strange is the old EC stuff. So I have a bunch of EC comics. And a, a Mitch original art. Ooh, who's that? That's Adam Strange from Strange Adventures number one. Very rare. Yeah, but wait, but who drew that? Mitch Garrett's. Very rare. Is that Garrett's? Uh, an actual yeah. pencil and ink Mitch actual Garrett's? Actual pencil and ink Mitch Garrett's, yeah. He doesn't do a lot, so he did one for me. How many months did that take him to do? <laughs> I'm not saying. Sorry, Mitch, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> what are you reading as comfort food uh, during these times? Because I, as I look behind, behind you there, you have plenty of options, my friend. Recently, I reread Peter David's X Factor, both the, the funny run from like the turn and, and the noir run, which I think is brilliant. I just started Invasion, the Keith Giffen Invasion thing, because I realized I never read that thing way back in the day. I'm reading Los Bros Hernandez because I just never caught around to that. So I'm reading a lot of Love and Rocket stuff. My most nerdy thing, I read a lot of Star Trek comics, like especially from the like, 80, like the Peter Krause stuff. I don't know. Those, that stuff. Oh, the early 80s DC books? Yeah, the early 80s DC books. There's just like, there's nothing at stake. And I don't know, it's just like, it's just a complete escape from everything. I'm looking forward to the answer to this question. What is the dumbest purchase you've made since the self-quarantine began? The dumbest purchase. Um, I mean, the, the stupid stuff was like for the when the week first started, the week it first started in DC, all there was no food in DC. We didn't have eggs and bread. All the markets were dead because everyone just started hoarding. And so we all got panicked and went on Amazon and bought all the food. <laughs> but it didn't arrive immediately. And then eventually the groceries started coming again. So now I still get these packages. I think I got like one yesterday where I got, um, um, I think like it was something like 30 bags of goldfish crackers for my children. <laughs> like, and like, like big old bags, like this big. <laughs> like my kids are gonna be eating goldfish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner <laughs> for the next 20 years. I thought you were gonna tell me, oh, I picked up some, you know, Jack Kirby panel page for a ridiculous amount of money. That's actually a dumber purchase <laughs> than the Kirby <laughs> <Yeah>. artwork. <laughs> How many goldfish crackers are currently in my house? Bold flavored, of course, because they won't eat regular, it's bold flavored goldfish. Tom King, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. It's been a lot of fun. Can't wait to finally read the second issue of Strange Adventures when it finally makes it to a, a comic I'm store dead. near us. It's very good, I'm telling you. It's what we love it. Hey, issue number one was great. So off to a great start. You, Mitch, and Doc doing a bang-up job. You and the family stay safe there. Keep washing the hands. You too, mine. Social distance if you walk out there. And uh, don't buy any more comic cards. Remember... I'm gonna wait for the paycheck to keep coming in. The royalties came out today. I am gonna. I'm, I'm going online. I'm going online. <laughs> I have enough goldfish. I know it'll be good for food. Now I can buy more. <laughs> Thanks to Tom King for taking some time to talk with us today. And if you haven't read The Sheriff of Babylon, I highly recommend you do so. Go ahead and help your local comic shop out by ordering it and having them delivered to you. Trust me, you'll enjoy it. And if you want to get more great comic book videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget about our Behind the Panel podcast. It's available from wherever you get your podcasts. And last plug, read our weekly column at SciFiWire.com. And as always, stay safe and remember, wash those hands. <laughs> <laughs>